Hi, I'm Ross from Coombsmith Property Accountants in Hamilton. We're just going to talk about a basic joint venture example today. Um, so I'm going to run, run through some general information. Um, just so you're aware, it's general information, it's not specific advice for you, so make sure you talk to your lawyer, make sure you talk to your property accountant, and make sure you get some advice around this, and this is just yeah, for some general information, give you some ideas, really. So to start with, why would you do a joint venture? And to me, it's all about a win-win scenario. It's got to work for both parties, and you've got to get something where both of you are winning from it, and you're both contributing something to it. So for this example, the vendor had a large block of land, um, and they were going to get a very low price for that block of land. And there's also a relatively large risk in the project, so by doing a joint venture, managed to reduce the risk from it. So the basic scenario was, is the vendor had a block of land, there was a part of it that could be subdivided off, and that could be subdivided into six different sections. Um, I'm missing the line up the top, but there was six different sections. Um, the key thing with this is it's, or one of the key things is it's one block, um, so there wasn't a separate property. And so what happened with the joint venture is effectively the joint venture bought this left-hand bit, um, it did the subdivision, um, and yeah, obviously it then settled on it later on. So one of the problem with subdivisions is there's large costs. So for this one, there's the development contributions, there's electrical, fencing, internet, roading, all the different costs adding up to over a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So it's a lot of commitment. So if the owner had have, yeah, decided to subdivide this, they would obviously already have the outlay for the property that's already there, but they'd also be spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars on the subdivision. So it's a reasonably high risk. Um, so with the joint venture, um, yeah, the joint venture was set up, a company was set up, the vendor sold to a company, 100,000 deposit was paid, and the rest of it was to settle when the section was sold. It's a really key thing. Um, it reduced the risk from the joint venture or the company's point of view, because the rest of it didn't have to be paid until settlement or sale of a section. So if it was six months until they sold a section, settlement then. If it was nine months, 12 months, still settlement on a section then. You generally then also have a clause that it can't drag on for too long. Five investors put in 75000 each, so that massively reduced the risk on it because all the roading, the fencing, um, the power, the internet was all paid in cash, so there's no loans. It also makes it simple from a loan point of view. The vendor owns the land, um, the costs are being paid by a joint venture, it's very hard for that joint venture to borrow because they don't actually own the land. So cash made it an awful lot easier. When the section is sold, um, every party gets a percentage of the profit. The vendor ended up with a much better sale price. So rather than really struggling to get a fair sale price for the whole bit of land, they ended up getting a couple of hundred thousand dollars more than what it would have been. Plus, they got a share of the profit. So the vendor was one share, and yeah, the five investors were a share each. So everyone shared in the profit, and everyone in this example ended up getting a good return. It was a trade, so. The joint venture or company bought the property, subdivided it, sold it, pays its tax, ends up with some cash, very easy to split that cash up. Um, whereas with most partnerships, generally partnerships don't work, so if you're looking at doing something long term, you need to be very careful, whereas a trade is short and sweet and makes it a lot easier. In this particular example, it all went really, really smoothly. It was a subdivision of lifestyle blocks. It was in a small town in New Zealand. Um, so the risk is who wants six lifestyle blocks sitting somewhere that's cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars you can't sell? Um, you can't really put houses on them because they're too big and not really don't really work for rental return. Um, so that was the risk. For this, by the time we, the titles were available, the joint venture had actually sold all six sections. So this time they got lucky, but it could have been six sections sitting there not being able to sell. So having multiple, multiple parties reduced that risk quite a lot.
protection always get some legal advice always make sure you have a good agreement and in this case it was a good shareholders agreement around who put what money in is there interest on that money and who does what work um, what happens if a party dies what happens if someone wants to get out of it you need to cover all those things in and get some good legal advice around it Tainting is another big concern. A lot of people don't want to be a developer and they don't really understand what tainting really means. So as a normal long-term hold investor, there is ways you can be taxed, but generally if you hold a property for more than five years, then the gains are taxable. Unless you're yeah, associated to developers, unless you're a builder, unless it's been rezoned, unless you've been subdivision, um, or there's a few other ones as well. Um, but in general, you sell after five years and it's a tax-free gain, you pass the bright line. If you're a developer, if you buy a long-term hold, it's tainted. And that means if it's sold within 10 years, any gains are taxable. So for developers, it changes to 10 years. Good thing about having multiple parties is if you are under the association rules, so by each party owning 24% or under, they're not actually associated to the company. So that means they're not tainted in any way. Be careful with relationships. For example, if I own 24% and my wife owned 24%, that would be 48%. We would then be associated to a company and we would be tainted. Obviously, this was buying a property, subdividing it, selling it, the intentions to make a profit. So there's GST and tax to pay. So yeah, hopefully that's given you some real good information and a few things to think about. Um, yeah, think about do you know any people who've got a large block of land but maybe not the money to subdivide it? Or is there farmers that you know who could potentially chop off a section? You could pay for the cost, do the subdivision, and then you could sell it and split the profits. Or keep it and put a house on it. Or you could buy it from the farm and put a rental house on it. Lots of different options. Um, in town, what are your neighbours like? Do they have big land um, components? Could you buy, yeah, do you have a neighbor, a friend or family who's got a large section where you could, and no money is good, um, if they've got a large section and no money, could you pay the subdivision costs, um, subdivide off the section, sell it, then split the profits, or could you buy it off them cheap? Yeah, there's a few different options like that. Or you could even, yeah, do the section together, build a house on it together and keep it long term. Just be careful, like I said, most partnerships don't work long term. Um, if you've got any questions, we're going to put this up on our Facebook page. So yeah, feel free to ask questions there and I'll try and answer them. I hope you've enjoyed that and I hope you found that interesting. Thank you.